My name is Christine and I am a moderator on the Project Avalon Forum. I'm going to give a brief introduction to one of our Avalon Forum members, somebody who I know personally, who I've become close with over the past two years. first became aware of his story through his postings and some private conversations and I realized during our getting to know each other that his story was profound. I'm struggling a little bit in trying to find the right words to uh, describe the experience that our friend here has had, but let me just uh, do my best at it. We cover so much material, all quite astonishing. His experience as a remote viewer, starting from childhood, interdimensional portal travel, travel that he experienced in advanced spacecraft, and attendance, which is fascinating, at large-scale meetings where ETs were present and the human representatives only played a minor role. He also has direct knowledge of the role of artificial intelligence and the threat that is posted by ET Trojan horse artificial intelligence infiltration. All of that and more is going to be covered in this astonishing conversation. Sometimes I think for some of us it's hard to see through the layers, not only the layers of ourselves, and in this case what was done to him, but also the layers of our mass consciousness that keep us looking at the outward frame of a being where the spirit is where the reality really truly lies. It was my honor, my pleasure, my joy to actually be able to be present with him for this first time he allowed an audio recording to be made of his memories. I just want to say as you listen to this that this is the first time he actually was not blocked from speaking. To this day he's still under quite a bit of electronic and other types of surveillance tricks, traps, but since this audio some pretty miraculous things have happened. So let this audio be the strength and the courage we all have to be able to speak our truth and let nothing silence us. So here we start this audio. Thank you all very, very much. One more word here. When I say thank you all very, very much, it's because I know there are others listening to this audio who have had similar experiences. And so it is to you that who have had the courage to speak your truth that I say thank you. There's so many different, I mean, I wouldn't even know where to begin, you know? I mean, there's the, the MyLab part, the small portion of the secret space program, the part working in the um, Federal Reserve where I was working with uh, those people that were in the Black Sun cult that uh, were inviting me to the Masonic Lodge that I went to a, uh, a couple times. I went out on the boat with some of them one time and they were like telling me all their philosophies and, and whatnot and uh, very, very dark people. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean. But it started for you as a child, right? Yeah. Did you have memories of it during your childhood or was that pretty much uh, erased? Well, yeah, I mean, or? the memories were kind of played with though a little bit like mm -hmm. when I, I would have memories of um, this will sound kind of ridiculous of uh, a pirate ship coming to get me oh. a flying pirate ship mm -hmm. kind of like Peter Pan uh, yeah uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> yeah kind of like you know yeah. it sounds totally ridiculous no oh, well, I get it <laughs> see I, this is those, this are, those are like the memories that I had right you know so, but that's obviously not what happened, but that's right. like, the, I don't know if that's, as a child, how I organized, it. organized mm -hmm. the memory, or mm -hmm. if the memory was screened or played with. Later on, when I worked doing things that I'm not very proud of in the other programs, I got to see how screen memories and blank slating people and that kind of stuff works mm -hmm. and it was done on me quite a bit and then you were co-opted into the program through what they they you actually was done to you and then yeah 
because yeah. uh, I, I, I was labeled uh, an intuitive empath, uh -huh. which um, back then they, they didn't have all these different nice esoteric ways of making you be a good remote viewer or biolocator or, or yeah. that kind of thing. They did it through terrorizing you into having an out-of-body experience, mm -hmm. kind of like uh, a lot of rape victims and whatnot right. report right. during their attack. They report uh, self-separation, being seeing it as a bystander occurring mm -hmm. to them, not actually, be, you know, that not kind of actually, thing. Yeah. They have the protection mechanism. That you right. Do you separate from the body? Yeah. You know, they had known about that kind of stuff for many years and. They, had, they use terror on certain personality types mm -hmm. to cause you to have an out-of-body experience. How do you think you were tapped? I mean, what do you think the process was that got you tapped for that? Because um, this is something interesting, I think, for a lot of people that... I come from a really big Navy family. I think some of that had something to do with it. I'm not exactly sure. I think my grandfather knew some what was going on. But I think... I, I remember going through a lot of testing. In uh, school? In school. Through the school system. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. That's important. I mean, yeah. if you don't mind me asking you questions, because uh, I think just, it's important. And all the testing, I like, even when I was in elementary school, and reading, and everything except for math, but in, in reading and, and all the, every, I tested like four or five grade levels ahead of where I was. Mm -hmm. But they always put me in like special ed kind of classes mm -hmm. and then they had kind of like an explore program kind of thing vans that would come and pick us up and take us to other facilities to where we met other kids like us or they took us out to Carswell Air Force Base mm -hmm. it's closed down now right, it's, typical it's somewhat closed down right. it's still in use and um, I have a lot of memories of um, okay. but did my, you my feel, dad. Were you made to feel special? Or? Not, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my dad was a coach. He took on coaching jobs and always, I mean, I remember a lot of the time we were usually within 15 minutes of that base mm -hmm. until my mom divorced him and, and left him and then moved back to this area. And then I started going to elementary school like in the fourth grade or, or whatever and then I started doing the testing there I remember doing testing there and um, were all the kids taken to the testing or was it, did they just come in and choose a few kids from a class or how did that happen if you can remember um, that I remember uh, them bringing the tests in to the class mm -hmm. and it was like those bubble tests you know right the, and, you fill up a little yeah and then um, later on, you would be told, oh, you did so well, you know, da 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 you know, we'd like you to do more testing. Mm -hmm. And then this testing would be observed, like a, a teacher that wasn't from the school that I didn't know would sit there, and it ended up being exactly like what I took later on in high school, like the ASPAB test right. for military and on that test, I tested uh, the top 10% in the nation mm -hmm. on that. Yeah. And uh, it was pretty much that, like well, that kind of stuff. What were the abilities they were looking for? Abilities to uh, intelligence? Intelligence, mm -hmm. cognitive, that kind of thing. They even did the weird things, of, which was very odd, of the weird cards with stars on them and different things like that, trying to get you to guess what was on them, playing the whatever object under plastic cups. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, different things. Did guessing. you ever have eye tests with colors or anything yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay. hearing. And hearing, yeah. Like yeah, tones. I, I, and yeah, and uh, I still, to this day, I can hear I can hear things way, way off. And mm -hmm. I, I hear a very high, like high pitch noise. Mm -hmm. I could hear very high pitch noises and they'd be like, wow, you can hear that. Mm -hmm. and, and they would be like, do it again. <laughs> you know, and I'd be, lift my right hand, mm -hmm. left hand, okay. and I could hear the harem. And, uh, yeah, I, they did the eye, the eye tests, mm -hmm. the different things with the thing they put over you with the color color stuff. And, right. Yeah. Um, 
I think it's important to, to talk about this because, I mean, I've listened to other my labs and different stories and stuff, and it's like, how are they, how are they tracking? How are they finding? Uh, you know, what are they using? Are they still doing it today? Yeah, they are. Yeah. They categorize. Uh, they they, it's a, they do it totally different now. It's a lot more sensitive. It's the, the testing or the equipment or and their treatment. Mm. Uh, it's not. It's a lot more sensitive the way it's done and the uh, blank slating is not done chemically anymore. Okay. So, can you talk about those experiences that you went through? Um, such as? Well, how, how were you blank slated or what, what uh, aspect of that? How did that start? Mostly it was done chemically through, uh, they give you shots. Okay. And then give you, uh, they would hit like hypnotic Kind of like when you go through hypnosis, mm -hmm. they would give you shots and then they would talk to you in a steady voice and put you down into uh, maybe a certain, not theta, but a certain level. And then... Were you being, did you have something on your head that was monitoring your brain waves too? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, and then they, uh, later, later on, they could do that with the um, kind of like piezoelectric kind of things they'd put on your hands or fingers mm -hmm. to monitor right. or just on your forehead just give you the drugs and then have you discuss what you went through and then they would uh, read like they're reading a book telling you a story and then show you a movie mm -hmm. of like something else and that would become the screen memory okay. overlaid okay so you would actually be seeing one picture, and they would, you would be telling a story that was disjointed from that picture, or you would that would no, it occurred in sequence. Oh, okay. So they were giving you a memory. They were basically yeah. You would give them your. It was also like a debriefing at the same time. Okay. You would tell them. You would it'd be like a debriefing what occurred, mm -hmm. and then they would like kind of like it, it, they kept it kind of childlike, you right. know. Okay. Uh, read you a story to make it more easily ridiculed or silly or kind of, you know, right. your, uh, the other experience. And then you would have a film uh -huh. that you would watch uh -huh. with headphones on uh -huh. that would be um, your uh, memory or dream Right. So okay. they would drug you, put you through some sort of experience, some torturous thing where they were doing things perhaps to you. Yeah, and then, and then they would, and training. After. Right, a training. Yeah. Okay. And then you would debrief whatever happened mm -hmm. to them. You would tell them where you went or what you experienced or did you remote view or whatever. And then they would blank you and then they would give you something to remember. Yeah. You know, if I can talk it. about this now without getting all... Yeah. Different, huh? Mm-hmm. Wow. Before, yeah. I, I couldn't even talk about it. No. Yeah, I'm, actually, I'm just realizing we're having a conversation that we couldn't touch on it before. Yeah. But, yeah, the reason, you know, I also feel it's very beneficial for anybody who's been through anything like this to just be able to, to let it out. And you realize yeah, that not, not being... Not everybody has the same experience. No, of course not. Because the, the major reason for the testing and each individual personality and personality type and uh, they break everyone down by you know they within the people that were intuitive empaths there were also people you were broken down into different groups mm -hmm. as to abilities and probable abilities mm -hmm. and, and whatnot so it was a lot bigger than uh, a lot of people they sent boom my lab, boom, super soldier, boom, you know, and I see that, and I, I kind of, it's kind of ridiculous to me in a way, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of it, but I kind of saw it as more of an adult later on. Mm -hmm. it, it was different for everyone else, and some people had a lot less traumatic experiences being my labs, and sure. some people had depending on uh, how stubborn or what type of personalities they had, had a lot worse. Mm -hmm. And um, they, you know, they would have, you know, they would have uh, 
kids do stuff to each other, you know, sexually, or beat each other up, or, you know, violently, or, or Did you whatever. see that those that were doing that? Did you, do you have visuals of who was in the room, who was there? Were these all, uh... I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, um, I, I remember seeing people, the adults, stand around just observing, watching, uh, filming, and taking notes, and, uh, the kids just looking constantly back for either approval or direction. Mm -hmm. They developed a, usually the females developed a relationship with the kids where the kids wanted approval from them mm -hmm. to where they would do whatever they were told. You mm -hmm. know, they wanted approval. Uh, if they didn't get approval from them, then uh, in would come one of the more military-ish male figures mm -hmm. that would subject them to one of the more negative things, you know, to where they were on the other side mm -hmm. of what was occurring. And were you sometimes alone, sometimes in groups and different scenarios? The alone stuff was more, um, never totally alone. No. You know, uh, usually it was like one-on-one -on -one with an adult or adults mm -hmm. where you're training, mm -hmm. you know. Um, a lot of meditation, altered states of consciousness, both chemically induced and then uh, self-induced. Mm -hmm. Do you and think it was like LSD type? Oh, that, that would definitely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that definitely happened. Uh, there was definitely non-human okay so uh, you do have yeah there was definitely non-human uh, uh, can you describe what the beings look like what, was it more than one one race or yeah and uh, I don't really like to when I see people that like are eager to talk about reptoids reptilians mm -hmm. and um, these I don't know why they, they don't look like mantises to me or whatever, but insectoids, I call them. Yeah, mm -hmm. when people talk about them on the inter, on the forums mm -hmm. and stuff, like and they sound like they want to know more or all that. <laughs> I don't even want to talk about them, right. think, visualize them, or anything. Uh -huh. You bring them into your consciousness, you bring yourself into theirs. Right. So don't become a beacon. Uh -huh. Don't set yourself up as a conscious beacon. Right. Because some people have this thing to where they think, well, you know, I have this, I can become this uh, beacon of strength around or me. Or knowledge. Or, or some power. You know, people get these self-inflated ego or esoteric ideas that they are special or have some strength or something uh -huh. or protection or whatever. And some people do have protection, but that's not something to go yeah. messing around with. And right. Well, you saw what they were involved in, and you've had direct experience with it. And, you know, I think what's the part of the thing that's happening kind of in a collective way is many people are having certain experiences, and they have a curiosity. And I guess you would say be very cautious of that curiosity. Yeah. And don't what? believe anything that you think you might be. Just remember what it did to the cat. To the what? The, the cat. cat. Curiosity that killed the cat, yeah. Right, for sure. Yeah. And where does that statement come from? Well, that's another story. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Not so, Schrodinger's cat, but... <laughs> yeah, not that one. No, so we have this, you know, uh, I just, if you don't mind, I really feel the story we're telling or the story you're telling is, is more common than I think a lot mm -hmm. of people are very aware of. And yeah. I don't mean common in the way, but I mean, I know part of the programming is to make the person that's involved in it feel special, chosen. Did you have that programming? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But the vast majority of the people that are involved are just programmed to forget. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, the vast majority of the people out there, it's happened to, and they have no freaking idea. Right. So we have layers and layers of programming. Yeah. Basically, sort of like where they've been categorized, and all tested, the, and, and then this one gets this, and this one gets this, and this one gets this. Yeah. Sort of and there's so many different types, mm -hmm. and 
reasons. I mean, you know, there's people out there that say, you know, that are like, think this is the most ridiculous thing in the world and this has happened to them multiple times. Mm-hmm. Sure. You know? Probably some of the most adamant against it are the ones that are the most exposed to it. In a yeah, way. And some of them are programmed to be yeah. against yeah, it. Exactly. Huh. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, they, and they can't really get out of their own program. So, what do you, for your own assessment, because this is your own assessment of yourself, as you were going through this as a child, and then you went into teenage, and then you, you went into the military, did you go into the middle of the um, military? Were you being trained or tapped uh, for that? No. I was told that I could not go into the military. Mm. Told not to, not to, and I didn't remember. And that, that was by your family, and no, no, that was by the program. By the program. Yeah. Oh, okay. And all I ever wanted to do was go into the Navy, like the rest of my family. Mm. And when I was 16 years old, I had a knee injury, and you see that huge <laughs> scar, yeah. like a patchwork quilt. I know. Um, and the Navy recruiters, because of my testing and all that, they were all over me. Uh-huh. And my mom was totally against it. It was very bizarre. She was back in her room crying when the recruiter came to the house. She wouldn't come out. She was crying. Was this already after she had split up from your father? Yeah. Okay. This, so my stepdad was Navy. Okay. So yeah. I'm just picking up here just yeah. for the record that your mother was put through a lot of stuff too. Oh yeah. 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 She's heavily, yeah. And I feel for her a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I do too. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, the Navy recruiters were all over it. They were mm-hmm. ready to, I was ready, as soon as I graduated, I was going in. That was said and done right. for my, in my mind. Like officer training? Did you that's have what training? I was going, I yeah. mean, that's. Academy, Naval Academy type stuff. Was it? I was not an ROTC or anything no. like that mm-hmm. in high school. Constant, I was kicked out of seven uh, junior highs and two high schools for fighting mm-hmm. and stuff, so. Was that part of your programming too? Uh, it was more of just having a shitty life. <laughs> okay, right, right. <laughs> and uh, a martial arts background to where mm-hmm. kids screwed with me and I didn't have the people skills to talk. Mm-hmm. You know, someone would come up and poke me in the chest and I would just throw them on the floor. Okay. That's all. I just, I didn't know any other way. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I had a knee issue. I went and got some x-rays, MRI, and went in for routine orthoscopic surgery. How old were you? Uh, 16 or 17. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. I was 17, mm-hmm. actually, because it was after I got back from Haiti. They're on a, a church trip, work and witness trip. Okay. Um, that was a crazy thing. I was just going to so, say, Haiti is... Yeah. It was right at, uh, there, right after their big Civil War thing. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I, I wake up, and my leg's totally in an immobilizer, and uh, everyone's standing around all sad, except for my mom. And uh, they're like, we're so sorry. Um, you had two dead bones the size of nickels that fell from your femur into your knee and tore up all your cartilage. And they had to do a bone graft from your tibia. Mm-hmm. And you have four screws in there. So they rebuilt the bone up above your knee? Up, yeah, yeah, up on top. Uh-huh. And they had to take almost, almost basically all the cartilage out. Wow. And they said that the recruiter had been there earlier and all that. And uh, my mom just could not wait to get out of them. And you're not going to be able to go into the Navy. I'm mm-hmm. sorry. Mm-hmm. And I was just like... And after that, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. Right. But it was, you know... Part of the thing was I was not supposed to go into the military anyway because part of some of the stuff some of the stuff they do you go off and you do for a while and then you're there is age regression done and then you're brought back to present time they can manipulate all that and they don't want you going into the military and having full recall and all that. Right. And were you set trained early on as a remote viewer? Oh yeah. You were given from the very beginning. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I think so were you given targets even as a child or? Yeah. 
-hmm. and then you would find out what would happen to some of those targets uh, in more of your kind of pre-teen, early teen years. Mm -hmm. And you would be... They, they would start learning who to start giving targets to and not because some people would like protect certain targets, mm -hmm. not give information on certain targets. Okay. So you still had enough aspect or some... some could maintain enough aspect of their own consciousness. Yeah, because you would, you would know that you were sending, you were targeting some individuals or small groups mm -hmm. for termination. Are you willing to talk about this? No. But, uh, I, I mean, I'm just also, I have spoken with others, so you know, I understand the, yeah. the devastation of it. Especially as a young, sure. No, it's, em it's, empath it's, it's shocking how empathic it's, young yeah. person. Yeah. yeah, I mean this is um, just also. I mean, and one of the things was they're very interested in using uh, using us for locating portals, like uh, interdimensional portals. You could call them that. Yeah. Uh -huh. To bring in mag transfer. Explain uh, that a little more if you can. Used kind of like in the kind of Stargate SG-4 TV series kind of thing. Uh -huh. In the beginning, they found that they could just transport non-living, inanimate kind of things like machinery and supplies and that kind of stuff. Uh -huh. And then they uh, developed ways of sending a, a rail of like a small kind of like train uh -huh. that would had seating, hold people, and send that through that was shielded in a certain way. Hmm. Were these tests they were doing, or where were they taking this? Uh, to bases or colonies. On different planets. Yeah. Uh -huh. Were you ever in one of the Stargates? Yeah. 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 What, were, what were the main... Can you talk about that a bit? Because I think it's I were, coming out. Right I have um, some memories. I'm, the one that I I remember I went to a couple times of memories of I could almost draw a picture. It's you. I come out. You come out in like a cavern, and there's an opening, like a, kind of like a grotto cavern opening, and outside there's kind of like a purplish sky, mm -hmm. with there were like a couple of moonish things out, and then there was water, steamy water. Hmm. And there were people that were laughing and kind of uh, having R and R out there, mm -hmm. just right outside the cave or whatever. And then it went further. Everything was built further inside the mountain or whatever. So there was a, a base of some. Yeah, it was a base of some sort. And uh, you turn back and look, and you could see the. And, and there was a loudspeaker. It was almost like a Grand Central Station. You could hear. Uh, inform just information being like uh, scheduled train yeah, schedules or something like that. That and uh, just just general information okay. being spoken and English. Uh, yeah, it was English. And uh, I remember lots of times seeing people and uh, in uh, just the one piece um, kind of jumpsuit kind mm -hmm. of things with flags from several different countries okay. on their shoulders. Any other badges or insignias that you can recall? Yeah, there were several insignias, some with, you know, triangle shape with a circle in it, a circle going around it that was like a dragon or a, a serpent of some sort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember that. It was a black patch with uh, the delta shape may have been yellow or something. It was the, those colors would uh -huh. stand out from black. Uh -huh. I kind of remember seeing that several times. Uh -huh. And the, the jumpsuits they were wearing, were they colored or? Yeah, different colors. Different colors. Yeah. Okay. Uh, different people wearing different colors. I guess they had different jobs or uh -huh. what, whatever. Right, but international. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't remember any of them having any lanyards with name tags or anything like that. No. I guess everything was biometric 
did they communicate verbally, or did you sense that they were communicating uh, other means too? No, they they were walking around talking to each other. Mm -hmm. I think they had to have a sense of community or a sense of social, mm -hmm. so uh, morale doesn't break down or whatnot. Right. Hmm. But I, I don't know where this was. I was just going to ask you that if you knew. I, it, I have no idea. But uh -huh. I remember going there, coming out of that a couple times. Uh huh. To that same place. Yeah. Because uh -huh. I remember coming out a couple times, seeing, looking out in different times, seeing different groups of people out by that little water area. Uh -huh. I mean, there was steam coming out. It right. was like. Were you there in the physical or were you just remote viewing it? Did uh, you actually. No, I was physically yeah, you there. You were physically there. Yeah. Right, so you're aware of your body and you could interact with everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, just to go back, because I'm trying to... So these portals, that they, these stargates that they started opening up, so they were actually transferring information, materials... People. Uh, people. And how long do you feel like this has been going on? Since at least the 50s. Okay. Really? Yeah. Well, all right. And, uh, and I know that... Um, Something happened to where a lot of them stopped working because they were they started retapping a lot of us trying to that had experience in locating them. Huh. A lot of them uh, they were trying to, I guess, something happened where a lot of some of these, I guess, people you call them cabal or whatever. Uh -huh. Some of these people were like trying to like get out, leave. Right. Uh, I guess they didn't have anywhere here that they felt mm -hmm. safe to hide out. And uh, they were asking, there were like groups of us that were like pulled onto craft that were asked to, uh, like three or four of us at a time, that were asked to locate portals. Okay. They had problems that portals, that the endpoints used to be at uh, a certain address or code, mm -hmm. we're now just flailing out in open space now. Okay, so they had a physical geolocality yeah. on the planet. Were yeah. they physically on the planet, or were they in the atmosphere of the planet, or both? Both. Okay, so you would find a geophysical location, and it would have a portal that would open up to some other. Yeah, and some right. some of them were like, kind of like were like the aurora borealis. Mm -hmm. It is where it was where magnetically the sun interacted with the atmosphere, mm -hmm. and it was over certain magnetic anomalies in the Earth. Right. Okay. And when and it had to do with the sun's behavior at the time mm -hmm. and the position of the Earth. It, things had to be just right mm -hmm. for certain portals to be operative, operative. Mm -hmm. and something was going on to where they were not operative mm -hmm. on schedule mm -hmm. and or the other side was sure. not opening up where it was supposed to. Okay. Were, did you know of any cases where people went into a portal and were lost? Oh, uh, in the beginning, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, people were on the other side were quite a mess. Right. Like sent someplace, yeah. So trying to get the picture on the on the whole thing. Were there portals that were always open? Or did they it was all tied into something? Not unless it was artificially kept okay, open. Right. So there were but they did I know there were attempts made and there are you know, according to a lot of the testimony that there are some portals that have been kept open. Did you ever have that would be, From what I remember, that would be a very bad thing. Yeah. It would uh, destabilize the other portals and something to do with the Earth's magnetic field and other... Right. It would casca have a cascading effect. Right. So this is why we've had things coming and going on the planet forever, I'm sure. You know, I mean... Yeah, not. and... And these magnetic point-to-point -point portals mm -hmm. and interdimensional doorways are not exactly the same thing. Okay. These in interdimensional rips mm -hmm. 
that I get I think some people are talking about mm -hmm. that are left open mm -hmm. are totally different. Right. And these kinds of things were opened by some of these dark magician practitioners way back like in the nineteen eighties through the nineteen forties. Okay. Like Or you mean the eighteen eighties? Yeah, the yeah, 1880s, 18, yeah, the 1880s turn of the and 1940s. The, like, uh -huh. like, I would call them the modern day uh, yeah, sorcerers. Like, were. Yeah, like the, the Nazis and the pre-Nazi mm -hmm. groups and a lot of them. This is the stuff I heard from these Black Sun people. Oh, okay, they, they talked about that. They knew already about my knowledge of uh, portals and stuff. Mm -hmm. They were talking to me about what I knew about the uh, dimensional uh, rifts and mm -hmm. passageways, mm -hmm. and I told them not that much. I said, I, I, I mean, I knew they, mm -hmm. I knew what they were, they existed, and that some of the reptilian beings or whatever traveled that way. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, if there's some of them that are stuck open or whatever, uh, that's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So in in the the aspect of your your further, just getting back to your life timeline here. So you went into you didn't get to the military. You had the knee operation. No. Didn't know what to do. Um, yeah, it was much later that I got into the Texas State Guard. Okay. Yeah, they uh, accepted me. It's. Uh, the Texas Military Forces, and uh, it accepted me into their uh, command control communications and communications and intelligence group. And I worked very closely with the uh, Army National Guard, but mostly with the Air Force National Guard mm -hmm. and with uh, secure satellite communications, and that, that kind of stuff mm -hmm. with them. And I made a lot of very good uh, connections. Worked very close with the Department of Homeland Security. I had to go to a lot of their, I had to get a lot of their certifications. Mm -hmm. The PacStar 5500 satellite system mm -hmm. that I supported, which it was the DOD communications hub. It basically connected the Department of Homeland Security, all of the Department of Homeland Security mm -hmm. entities, local, all of the local police, first responders and military together through one communication hub mm -hmm. through whatever they were using, whether it be just a CB radio, a telephone, a satellite phone, ham radio, whatever, I uh, would be able to patch them all together to where they could all speak to each other. Right. And also pull down uh, the secure uh, DOD internet that they had to where the uh, Air Force and Army uh, National Guard could come in and plug their encrypted laptops into the DOD infrastructure and uh, communicate. And during the time you were doing that, were you aware of the, the, the nature of this? I mean, did you, I mean, because it sounds like, well, we need communication between all these Oh, I found out. Oh, I sat yeah. there. I mean, I was, I was sitting there working the thing. I heard, I found out all kinds so of stuff. What were you, were you, you were, you, do, you didn't write software, but you were doing the hardware? Oh, um, I mean, I, I worked, it was basically just a whole bunch of hardware talking mm -hmm. to each other through uh, switches and uh, there was some software involved network connectivity and uh, keeping the satellite uplink connected and uh, then I helped the people with their encrypted laptops get connectivity to the to the network that we had the little hub we had that was connected to the DOD satellite mm -hmm. you know and I supported right. them. Department of Defense DOD, yeah. right? Yeah, and DHS. Yeah, and the what, Department of Homeland Security. Yeah, whoever, just, whoever happened to be need to come into the tent that uh -huh. had the clearance that needed to... Have the information or have the... Yeah. the was it a secure network that... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. the DOD. Right, so it was only. a closed network and you were part of putting that all yeah. together to keep all of these different right. government agencies... Right, and, and it was also people sitting around, you know, using phones. We had voice over IP phones mm -hmm. that we had plugged in 
IP phones mm -hmm. that hooked into the DOD. Did you have a special clearance? I did, but I had a, a DOD card uh -huh. that I never kept it with me. Uh -huh. I never knew what my clearance was or anything. Oh, no. Okay. No. So, but you had access to a lot of people. Yeah. I had a lot of data. Special access program. Okay. Right. So, during that stay there, how long were you working there? I was in the Guard from 2007 to 2012. Okay. But mm -hmm. uh, was that when you're in the Guard? Is that part time or? Yeah, it's yeah part time. Yeah. Just like whenever an emergency happens or okay. during training. So, I guess I would say that was part of your education or eye opening experiences. That mm -hmm. Did you start to become aware of things there that you hadn't been previously aware of? Mm. I was. I was already aware. I just started getting a lot of information, okay, and made a lot of connections. Right. A lot of some people I still talk to. Uh huh. A lot of those people are the people that started disappearing. I mean, literally, people calling me saying, "Hey, so and so didn't show up to work for the last two weeks. Their family said they went and looked in their window, and their house is empty, and." It's a mess. It looks like they moved out in a very hasty manner. Mm -hmm. And neighbors said that they saw moving trucks mm -hmm. moving out, moving, moving them out fast as hell, and then whoosh, took off. Moved them out in less than two hours and mm -hmm. moved, moved them out. No explanation, nothing. Right. So the sensitivity of being in that particular uh, arena and the information that was coming in, did you start to make conclusions about? Yeah, I've made several conclusions, uh -huh. and then they've been wrong. Oh, okay. And <laughs> the people that you worked with, the general ethical, moral compass that they carry, are there a lot of, like, are there people that are working in this that have a lot of information right now that... Oh, yeah. And are they under threat to not talk? Or, oh, yeah. Yeah. I uh, I got approached by some guys that told me I shouldn't be speaking so freely. Mm -hmm. Not too long ago, while I was living with my mom. Mm -hmm. And they came to your house. They called. No, they you out? Uh, when I I was getting away from them, my situation there, I went to uh, this shuck and jive place I go to every once in a while, mm -hmm. and. Um, I, this guy sat down next to me, and he had Arabic written on one arm. He had a short sleeve shirt on. And another guy sat on the other side of me. And I looked at the guy's arm, and I said, Was that Arabic? And he said, Nope. And he pulled his sleeve down, and I said, Hmm. I said, You wouldn't happen to have anything written on the other arm, would you? Because I had met a guy who had Arabic on one arm and Sanskrit on the other. Mm -hmm. And he, and he said, yeah. And he just lifted his shirt up real quick like that and put it down like that. And I said, that's Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. He said, how'd you know that? I said, I, so I knew a guy in the guard that uh, had pretty much those same tattoos. Mm -hmm. And that opened it up. And the guy to the left said, oh, really? He said, you know, you should probably be a little less open on the Internet. Mm -hmm. Just like that. Just like that. Mm -hmm. And they didn't order anything to drink or anything. And then they got up and they left. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a sort of a way of communication, right? Yeah. Symbols and signs and very direct. And, yeah, yeah, right. Letting you know who they are and yeah. delivering the message. And yeah. Did you feel threatened? Put it this way: when I left, I took my pistol out of its sheath and put it under my leg mm -hmm. and paid very close attention to other traffic and everything on the way home. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I would say that was it. I have a Right. So, uh, yeah, I was... Uh, that, it got my attention. Yeah. Have you had more of the same? Or? Nope. No. All right. Yeah. Nothing else. And do you... This is just an offhand question, but people you know without mentioning anybody, but are there people out there right now that wish they could come forward and speak more clearly? Are they still, like, you know, trying to pass the messages, say, uh, subversively from one person to the next? I think they would rather pass the buck, 
pass the info to someone they know mm -hmm. that is putting the info out there. Right. But at the same time, their information is only as good as the person that they're getting it from. Right. So they're compartmentalized. Don't yeah. Mm -hmm. So I have friends in several different groups, mm -hmm. and I get the information, and I kind of compare it. And if I have points that match, I consider the information somewhat vetted. Mm -hmm. Then I'll find a news story out there that has some of the information mm -hmm. in it, and then I'll post it. Right. And that's my way of well, that's, yeah. putting the information out there indirectly. Right. I'm not going to just come out and say, da 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 da, da because then the this whoever powers that be are going to be able to look and deduce exactly where I got the information mm -hmm. from. Right. And put your source at risk also. Yeah. Right. Well, that's what I mean. I'm looking to a lot of people that are in, in the Intel biz in a way, and this seems to be how they're doing it. They're kind of triangulating information. And After I posted that stuff yesterday, uh -huh. the, pre the president of SAIC went to my site. Okay. And what is SAIC uh, for the uninitiated? <laughs> it's uh, one of the major computer defense contractors. Uh -huh. oh. President at defense contractor. Okay. Frank O'Donnell, president at defense contractor. Right. Okay, we go there. Uh -huh. National Security Executive SAI Science Applications International Corporation, uh -huh. SAIC. Uh -huh. They have been pursuing me like crazy mm -hmm. to come and work on Navy contracts, hmm. which I've said no to. And, uh, you know, it shows here that he, he, he viewed my profile two days ago. Right. Uh, after I posted uh, some information on uh, the portals and uh, mm -hmm. torsion field stuff. Yeah. So just a... I mean, this is all very fascinating to me, as you well know. <laughs> like, you know, coming from myself, my myself point of view of not having any any training or apparently I have no recall of military background, and yet, you know, it seems to me. I know you have this broader, bigger picture too, where we're looking at we're looking at a much, much, much bigger picture. It gets bigger all the time, and so, you know, we're looking at the origins of the. Uh, human race, we're looking at other races from other distant planets or galaxies, we don't even know where they're, we're looking at interdimensional beings, we're looking at portals through time and space, artificial and natural ones, and, you know, all of these these things, and I, um, you not, know. Not to mention all the breakaway societies that yeah. hung around from all the uh, civilizations that have come and gone here on Earth. Right. Plus AI technologies, ancient yes. technologies. The AI is something that those in the space program and intelligence are very concerned about. Okay. They're um, concerned in what way? I mean, are they they're concerned of other AI presences is that they, they're not, the ones they're not writing, the codes they're not writing. Right. Right. Uh, so how is that being perceived right now? As a very extreme and present danger, major threat. A lot of the current technologies have a mental component mm -hmm. to interface. The air spacecraft or whatever, there's not a stick. Or, you know, you can, things do not respond that quickly. Mm -hmm. Right. So it responds directly to the person's nervous system. Mm -hmm. Well, AIs, through computer usage, all kinds of different way, can have similar to entity attachments, mm -hmm. kind of like a virus. Sure. In the AI, you've got this AI, uh -huh. and there's something else conscious. Like a like a in like a program it, yeah. running it, right? Yeah, like a program that gets into a human being, right? That lives in its electrical in your electrical nervous system, uh -huh. and um, uh, after uh, Stargate travel, after portal travel, before using or operating certain machinery. In the early days, they would use EEGs and other things to test to make sure that your baseline EEG and other readings didn't have 
a another reading over it. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, I don't know the, what they have now, but the last thing they had when I went in was a thing that went over your forehead like that. Mm -hmm. And they went over your forehead, they put it there until it beeped, and then they took it away. And there was a cool little screen on it and everything that showed the waves on a grid and all that. And they could tell if you had had any AI in, uh, infections or, or whatever. And um, if you had, there's no way in hell you're getting anywhere near any of their tech. Are you tying some dots together for me right now? But go ahead. Because we'll talk about it. Yeah. You had those um, IE parasites or whatever uh -huh. codes, whatever program yeah, or codes in you, and you interface with the tech then it gets into the device you're operating and can get into the network, which is has a biological and electrical... It's like a biological... Uh, I've seen them replace them. They're kind of like almost like things you would put in the freezer to get frozen and use like an ice pack. They're kind of like... Silicon. Gel packs. Gel, silicon. Yeah. yeah. Could be silicon. Based. Yeah, it, but they're um, biological. Right. Like a lie. Like a bio. Yeah, well, just, yeah. just so you know, but, we, we ran into some things. Some okay. That later. But, it, and, but it's kind of like, it's biological and like, kind of like a, I guess, kind of like a brain or nervous system uh -huh. or whatever that they slide in and slide out and replace. They can actually whatever. put them into the hardware. Yeah. So if yeah, you as a you as a person as a biological being as a person has any of these AI implanted, yeah. I would just call them codes for lack of a better word. They won't let you near anything because oh, no. you are going to contaminate what they're trying to control. Uh, you can bring down their defense Definitely. grid systems and all that, and it's happened. Right. right. Yeah. And these, um, some of this biological, electrical components that they have in these spacecraft that we see flying around that we think are alien, that are not, or whatever, are what allow us to have the neurobiological tie-in mm -hmm. to the technology to be able to do the things... Okay, so we, let's just Humans. say government, human agencies, right, that are, are at the upper echelon of, of knowledge, let's call it that mm -hmm. way, they actually have craft that are l allowing certain human beings access or interface with different... Yeah, they completely yeah. interface. They're, okay. they're, I wouldn't say alive, but they're biological, they're somewhat alive. So there's they're conscious in some yeah. level. They're conscious they're of what's happening around them. It's beyond the com com uh, computer. Yes, it's way, beyond, way, beyond, way, way beyond. Way beyond. Them. Way beyond. Okay, so they're AI semi biological beings. We could actually call them entities of a sort and say, are they independent? Are they controlled? Are they giving? It, are they? Do they have any autonomy? Um, I, I. I I wouldn't say they're like the HAL 3000 or whatever, anything that, like that, uh -huh. but they self-monitor, they interface okay. with the human, they monitor the human's health, they interface with the human so much, they like become one. Okay. And as a person just almost before a person is thinking what they want to do, what weapon system they want to engage, what maneuver they want to do, or whatever, mm -hmm. the craft is already making the needed Adjust adjustments It's like and an extension of your body. Yes. Right. So the, the craft becomes your body extension. Basically. Yeah. Right. So you're managing it on that. Yeah. It's almost level. like a prosthetic. Right. So are they using this only for military, or is this being used in other ways? 
I don't know. It has all kinds of applications that would help humanity. Sure, of course. One thinks one, one immediately goes there, but it seems yeah. the predominant control mechanism of this right now is... Yeah. Uh, anyone that's in a wheelchair that has spinal damage, uh, there, there's no reason for that. Right, right. I mean, with what they have. Right. People when are suffering needlessly. you, the person, the, the conscious human being, is now been um, molded with this craft. Melded is the right word. Yeah. Can you, at that moment, you yourself override the the input from this? Well, yeah. Could you take control, basically, and say... Yeah, you're in control. But could you, if you broke away from the, whatever it is that's giving you that ability? Well... We, we put it right when we said it is basically like a prosthetic. Okay. You, you are in control. Mm -hmm. Your mind is in control. It's just like having a prosthetic arm. Right. But it's like, sort of you, like... And, and it's plugged into your electrical system, right. and your mind is telling it to do this, this, right. this, this, but this. But if you, let's say, became rogue, you went rogue <laughs> to the system, and you decided, I'm going to do something totally different... Because it's somewhere there's, you're... There's other precautions for that. I would say that there must be something that they yeah. can kind of unplug you there. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. yeah. There's... What it is is there's a... It's a... You are in this little thing that kind of plugs into the wider craft, mm -hmm. like the fuselage. Okay. Then that plugs into the craft. You can be ejected from that at any point. And right. there's, so there's some other, something else monitoring yeah. you. Yeah, and then that, that cra then the l larger craft has a return to home feature, oh. and then uh, that uh, fuselage oh. okay. thing has a beacon and uh, a short-range travel. Have you been told about this? Have you seen uh, it? Have I've you, seen it. You've yeah. argued it? Argued it? No. I've, you've I've, seen them? I've, I haven't been on the large... Big uh, cigar-ish looking. The ones that are on the on the forum also, right? That no, I've seen them. Okay. Uh, I've been on the small smaller ones that are kind of squished down and have double look like. Uh, I've been on other ones. I've been on the big triangles. I've been on them. How do you get transported, or how does that happen? How does one find themselves, and were you trained that way, or is it, is this like like you sitting on the couch with me? Or is this some other aspect of? Well, there's also an aspect of uh, having avatars. S some of the uh, people have avatars that look like the greys. Some of the gray encounters people have are just uh, biomechanical robot things mm -hmm. that someone is in a kind of like a, a recliner kind of thing sitting there with they, there's things on each side I mean they're sitting there doing mm -hmm. like this you know controlling them mm -hmm. with uh, all wraparound visors on right. and I mean people say they don't get in it feels like they, there's no feeling or soul to these things they're not they're machines mm -hmm. and uh, some of these I mean there's so many of these different beings out there that people confuse with or what call grays or whatever, right. you know. But those ones that are all smooth and look a certain way are military built biopods. Yeah, bio kind of kind of like the movie Avatar. Right. Yeah. You know, and they're controlled by people, you know, yeah. nowhere near. Right. And, you know, the craft they're on is a, basically a, well, a, a drone, and um, avatars or drones, I mean, it's all drone. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Do you have an opinion on when, and because you said, you know, your own feelings about this military abduction and all that stuff started happening in the 50s, and, you know, most people now are, you know, very aware of Roswell and the first, so the crash and all of that, and... As a program, who's running it? Who's at the top of the? Oh, jeez. Um, we can stop anytime you want to. No, <laughs> I mean that question. That's. Uh, 
I've I've looked at that pyramid so many times, mm -hmm. and every time there's so many people with their arrogances and that think they're at the top of the pyramid, and I find out that they're like nowhere near mm -hmm. like these the black sun cult people, just because basically they run the Fed. They run the Babylonian money magic system. Mm -hmm. They do. Yeah. It's the Black Sun cult. Yeah. They run it. They think through that, black magic. Yeah. Yeah. Money is black magic. It is. Yeah. They, they they went into detail talking about that. Yeah. We could maybe hold that one on the side. I uh, know. Like I said, I don't know where to start. I know. I know. So, but we have. I'm seeing that. You know. Let's. We'll continue but, through this part of yeah. it. Yeah, uh, who's controlling all this? I ah, hell if I know. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, it's not, it's off world. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about people, it, you know, there's definitely some bloodline, there's a bloodline thing going on. Okay. Now that becomes a whole other interesting to delve into bloodlines and to try to understand what is a bloodline and what does that mean and why do we have so much attention on it? I mean, I think multi, we're we're multi, we're looking through multiple uh, scenarios right now, and somehow they all feed back to each other. Um, yeah, and the bloodline all feeds all up to off world. Mm -hmm, right. And they're basically um, some sort of um, mixture. Right. Of well, we're all mixtures. We're all mixtures. Yeah. That's a, something I just, you know. <clears throat> and, and there's been, you know, I, I was debriefed and talked and told about uh, meetings that we had had with all these other groups that had come in. And just about every group that came in claimed that they had a hand in our creation. <laughs> right. You know, so at the beginning, the American uh, military was extremely indignant and pissed off because mm -hmm. they were very, a lot of them were still very Judo-Christian kind of people, you know, and right. these aliens were coming in saying they created us, da 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 But, like, there were, like, dozens of races, supposedly, that were coming in, different races. How were you debriefed? Were you in meetings? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean... There were, there were like, I've been in a bunch of different situations to where it was like big meetings, almost like a miniature kind of like UN kind of thing with people sitting around mm -hmm. talking about a stuff. Conference sort of mm -hmm. setting and, yeah. With me sitting, looking and reading off of kind of like a tablet kind of thing, reading what they're talking about because I didn't understand, they weren't speaking English, okay. you know. So and there's always someone sitting there doing a sign language that wasn't regular sign language. It was a sign language that looked more Native American to me. So, and, <clears throat> and in these meeting spaces, there were military, U.S., other country military, too? Yeah, I didn't see a whole lot of military. It looked more like a lot of civilian-looking people. Statement type? or Yeah, or? and... Some mainly humans, but mm -hmm. strange looking humans. Okay. Mm -hmm. Strange looking humans. So, yeah, so it was discussed that these varying races that had been coming onto the planet all yeah. had something to do with the human creation. I remember some, there were some, some humans there. There were s several w women with one man that had dark black hair. And when I say olive complexion, I'm talking, they look just like olives. Like, green, like, look like olives. Okay. And um, wore, like, just different kind of clothing hmm. kind of stuff were there. And the men had, like, military haircuts, short, you know, short on the uh, sides, kind of a little taller on the top. Mm -hmm. Women had very beautiful hair, you know. Mm -hmm. But they were, like I said, mostly except for when I was real young, mostly of what I dealt with were human. Mm -hmm. But they were just different, right. different kind of human. Right. But a lot of different kind of human. Mm -hmm. 
Different colors, different. Did you ever see different any, sizes? Did you ever see really, really large, like very tall? Very yeah. tall. Yeah. Like, what, did you ever see any with six fingers and uh, six toes? Uh, well, you wouldn't see their toes, maybe. But no, but yeah, one time with six fingers, with weird, larger, rounder cranium and back, but it wasn't all like cone head like you see on TV. No, their skull kind of went back like ours did, mm -hmm. and then the cranium went kind of further back, mm -hmm. but it looked kind of soft. Okay. Didn't look hard. Okay. And their facial structure was looked kind of a little bit narrower, uh -huh. you know. But they looked human, and the women wore. There was a, a women. There was a woman and a guy, and the the woman uh, was wearing uh, kind of like almost not belly dancer, but like a, a veil. A veil, uh -huh. and kind of like meshy kind of clothes, mm -hmm. real drapey and flowy. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they were real pale. Okay. Hmm. Wow. And their eyes were a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. Some of them, some of them, their eyes were a little bit bigger. They they were pale. And the, uh, and during these debriefings, was this was there something planetary being decided, or was it more galactic? Or I don't know. Uh, don't know. I don't know. I was just I was sitting there, reading what I was given to read, and and looking around. I. I was sitting there reading some of the uh, information about different groups that were talking about the Earth experiment. So you were more like an emissary messenger? I was there as a empath okay. to get a feeling of aggression or not untruthfulness of Deception. Right, right, I got it. Yeah. I got that, like, they were looking for... Yeah. yeah I get that. But I, w I, mean, I wasn't the only one. Right. Uh, There's three of us mm -hmm. sitting there with uh, the group we were with, and we were, like, sat down low to where, I mean... No, you, like, when you're... Um, like an amphitheater, almost, or...? Well, no, I mean, like, you know, when you're, you see people at the judge or whatever, right, that right, thing right. that goes around... Like they were sitting higher, the people we were with, and like we were sitting down lower uh -huh. to where like we were like this. Huh. Okay. And we're sitting there looking at our material and kind of uh, if we have had any feedback, we were supposed to give them feedback. But we were, I think we were all just pretty much all, you know, like what the hell, whoa. Uh -huh. You know, yeah, it was supposedly the earth was some big um, kind of. It like, really freaked me out when I watched uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy mm -hmm. at the end when, you know, it was like the Earth was just some big experiment for some inquisitive other interdimensional right. that wanted to know the meaning of life and that kind of stuff. It was like basically saying that kind of crap, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, saying, you know, all these different people created us and came in and manipulated us and we're all claiming some sort of dominion over us or creation of us and mm -hmm. and uh, bickering or fighting about and and we didn't know what to think of it and mm -hmm. we didn't know our genetics studies and that kind of stuff we had gotten we had asked for and received genetic information from them and and then all this kind of stuff, and some mat, some stuff matched, some stuff didn't, mm -hmm. you know. So they were trying to make sense of it all. Right. Um, there is such a, a large body of, of information. I always keep telling people we're we're swimming in the sea of, of intelligence. And I mean, what's happening for me right now as I'm listening to you is like this information is coming into my field, and I'm I'm, I'm connecting some dots, um, specifically with AI stuff. I'm very, very uh, aware of that and working with the group that we're working with, mm -hmm. uh, what we keep finding. And I have to say I'm working very in, leery of AI. Stuff. Oh, we, yeah, you told us to be aware. And we don't go into the AI thing, but there's, there's layers and layers and layers to it, obviously. And, um, and some which, of the crashes, uh -huh. the retrievals, right. were actually um, on purpose were um, Trojan horses right. sent here 
Right. So we would build Pick up this kind of stuff right. to give the AI median down here to travel right. and be amongst us right. and be able to interface with us. We needed to have a few minutes break here to walk around and shake some things off. And so now we're back with part two of this audio. So we were just kind of picking up where we left off. And we were, I was asking you, we went back to that place where you were in that meeting conference hall where mm -hmm. you were sent there to pick up information for your handlers, I guess. Mm -hmm. call them and how you were talking about the different races again and uh, the presences of beings and the olive skin women, how beautiful they were and uh, the presence they held and how you were feeling personally was just intimidated, not sure if it was going to be a good experience or a bad experience for mm -hmm. you. And how after the meeting was over, uh, you were taken back and then you were given the injection again and you gave the download. Yeah, typical right? debrief. Typical debrief, so there was three of you, right? Yep. And so you were all debriefed, and so what we were saying... Separately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what we were saying was that you were more like a, a vessel or a container. They sent you into a space to pick up with certain things you were looking for, tuned to. And then they debriefed you. They emptied you out, basically, like a flash drive. And then, Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, and then at that point, you don't have cognition of what you actually picked up. Mm -mm. You were just the flash drive for them, and yeah. then you started. I, to I say know about what they wanted. To, they wanted us basically to pick up on deception, possible threats, just you know anything. I guess they should be watching out for. Right, any threat against them right. per se. Yeah, <laughs> the language that was being spoken, none of us understood. It was some sort of universal language that I guess most people there understood. There was one person doing some sort of sign language that reminded me of the uh, sign language I saw Native American elders using mm -hmm. uh, on the reservation when I was younger. If there was any telepathic stuff going on, we weren't picking up on it or it wasn't directed to us. But uh, what we were given reading material to read and absorb, but also to keep our logical minds occupied so we could pick up things without reading into things right. to naturally pick up on right. threats and whatever. Right, so a, 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 a part of your brain wave or activity was being separated from the logical brain that would have overwritten anything that was coming in. Is right. That, yeah. Okay. yeah. And then afterwards we did the typical thing. We went in, got a shot. I remember the shots always were kind of like tetanus shots. They burned. In the arm, in the muscle? In the arm, mm -hmm. in the shoulder, or in the hip, usually in the shoulder. Except when I was really young, they always get it to you in the hip. Then they would do the thing where they would start talking to you in a regular voice and talk to you to where you would kind of start fading away and kind of getting listless. And um, <clears throat> when I was younger, that's when they would like kind of read you like a kid's story and then show you like a kid's kind of movie that would turn into kind of like a dream scenario. So that would become a screen memory or a dream memory mm -hmm. for you. I guess the chemical then somehow blank slated your memory of whatever they wanted to target. I don't mm -hmm. know. What I was starting to get into uh, was that they found that they could only uh, use this chemical on you a certain amount of times before it started causing neurological problems mm -hmm. or uh, behavioral problems. Mm -hmm. Like psychotic breakdown, breaks. yeah, different mm -hmm. things like that. So they started with having psychotic breaks with reality. I, I yeah. guess I, I don't mm -hmm. know that I had that, but that was. They ended up moving to having little, just little devices that were battery run that hand remote controlled. They would use. They didn't. They didn't need to give shots or use chemicals at all anymore. Frequency or yeah, frequency. electromagnetic pulse or something. Yeah, like that. I, I think it was just a frequency. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would they could they could hide it. 
you know, under like leaves around or around. It, it just had to be around in a certain area. And uh, they put uh, kind of like earwigs in, uh, communication devices that intelligence or whatever people use that you can't see on, they go pretty far mm-hmm. in. Uh, they would put uh, one of those in each ear to where they could. Uh, it also worked kind of like noise canceling devices. You shoot a gun, mm-hmm. uh, as you pull the trigger, the sound wave causes the uh, electronics to close, I guess, a circuit in mm-hmm. it to where you don't hear the blast of the gun mm-hmm. kind of a thing. Uh, they had some sort of things in their ears to where they weren't affected. Hmm. It had to work with the way it vibrated the bones in your ears and went into your neurology. Mm-hmm. But they would use that and then also the tone of their voice, the way they would talk to you and then their body language, they would look at you and nod and mm-hmm. talk to you in a certain way and look at you in the eyes and you would start to fade and feel Mm -hmm. a certain way and then they would get you into that mode without using chemicals but Uh, when you're during the time you did you were you exposed to that too yeah yeah Mm -hmm. so by now i don't know what they have right but what you were saying that was so chilling really and we've we this part of the conversation we didn't get on tape was like how actually you left that whole scenario feeling like we are just human race we're just really cattle we're just oh yeah a resource for these other groups and how yeah you are a throwaway piece of technology yeah like like you know oh this thing's out of batteries you know shake it around a little bit okay and throw it aside reach in our bag and grab another one out right know. right he's the outdated model now anyways yeah. right now we yeah. have more sophisticated manner of, of programming people and right. using them and, um, yeah. and still <clears throat> we're we're that's why I'm, I'm still pretty uncomfortable with a lot of the terminology used in the MyLab topics uh-huh. and uh, Super Soldier and all that stuff that's thrown around because even in the subcategories, there's sub subcategories of how they, you know, break you down. You know, like even we were talking about, uh, you, you mentioned a crystal cavern and, you know, and I uh-huh. kind of yeah, raised you. my eyebrows because they took us to... I don't remember how we got there, but we were brought, uh, the people who were more empathic were brought to a crystal cavern. It was really, really hot mm-hmm. in there. But we were told the crystals were alive. We were not allowed to touch them. If we touched them, we would could damage them or they would damage us. Mm-hmm. That we were to reach out with our minds to them and they would either accept us or reject us. Mm-hmm. And... Um, that was some sort of test, and uh, some of them had a, when we reached out with our minds, had a pink or a blue energy field mm-hmm. or aura around them. Mm-hmm. I don't know how that came up in our conversation, but when you mentioned... Well, we were talking about how many people are right now penetrating into these different realities that are around yeah. us all the time. And so for you, what I said was that as a group, session that we were doing, which we call planetary planetary impasse or planetary healing, uh, that we were uh, shown down into some crystal caverns. Now, mm-hmm. I, the way I found them was another member said, was talking about the mantle, uh, the subconvection planes that are under the mantle, under the lava flows. You know, we've got mm-hmm. the crust of the world, and then there is movement under it. Yes. And I found it deeper down than that. And then we found ourselves as a group going into these crystal caverns. And then I was speaking of somebody else I was sharing that with, and they had talked about another uh, woman that was going into these crystal caverns. Yeah. And how I call it. Did they describe it as hot and hard to breathe? Uh, see, I I didn't go in in the physical, but I a lot of times during any session I will get uh, out of breath or I'll get hot or my body will break into a sweat, and I can't recall if it was during going into the crystal or not. But yes, we were calling them resonant chambers. They're memory chambers. They are the live part of the planet. I, I have no doubt of that at all. So I was just sharing that with you, and that popped you into mm-hmm. telling me Because the adults it. didn't go in. Because no. it was like, we could only stay in there for like 20 minutes. Right. And uh, we Do you think, again, you were being used to pull information out of these crystals? To be I, debriefed? Or? I don't know. I think they were wanting to say, see which of us could connect 
with the crystals. Right. right. Well, they're they're they're. I mean, for me, they're <clears throat> they're they're high frequency memory memory and mm -hmm. uh, energy conductors. And so I wonder if they were using you the same way they were prior to that, where they were putting you into these spaces and you were picking up the information that was there. If so, that was removed. Right, know. you wouldn't remember that because of it. I just remember that it was, uh, the short memory I have of it was, I was probably 10 or 11. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just remember it was, I couldn't hardly breathe. It was like, I'm talking like 120 degrees or more. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and the crystals were quite big. Mm -hmm. And they weren't like the ones that they showed in Mexico that were not that far underground on TV uh, probably 10 years back. Mm -hmm. but I think they were made of quartz. You couldn't quite see. These were like um, pretty much crystal clear with mm -hmm. some inclusions in them. Okay. Uh, Large? Like, yeah, uh, what size? like uh, probably 18 inches to or larger around mm -hmm. and coming a, a good probably seven feet out of the sides on mm -hmm. the ground and they kind of crisscross. Some are smaller, some are larger. Right. Wow. And do you, do you always have memory of this or does it come and go? Or um, do, you have, do you have any? Well, I mean, I always have, yeah, I've always had memory of it, but I didn't know, I didn't have any context. Mm -hmm. Just kind of like it was a dream or right. something. I mean, after I had that eye surgery and I had that full recall, mm -hmm. and then um, I blabbed all that stuff to the people in the recovery room. I think I wrote up a thing in the Avalon forum about that. Right. It kind of freaked some people out at Parkland Hospital. Yeah. And then I, I was in really bad shape because I remembered some of the negative stuff I was a part of that I did and because uh, I was a part of the other side of the table mm -hmm. <clears> of <throat> some of the stuff I'm talking about and uh, I don't remember a lot of that because I had some very kind visitors that came and helped me forget okay. right. yeah that uh, they told me I there was no productive or good reason for me to have those memories and they helped me f uh, forget them uh -huh. so <clears throat> between that incident and the last couple of weeks what I've gone through with getting rid of those entity attachments mm -hmm. you know I've been able to access a lot more mm -hmm. and obviously talk a lot more I sure. mean, last time you were here I could I couldn't get probably 10 words into any of this before I emotionally locked up. You touched with me today, you know, on some of the most um, nefarious of things that are being ha are happening right now. And I feel like if we don't keep our eyes open, if we don't keep seeing what it is, if we don't see, uh, you know, the AI influence amongst us, if we don't see the transhumanist agenda that's out there, and I loved Alex Jones yesterday or the day before. You know, when he's on, he just taps right into it. And what he was saying was basically, no, no, I will not agree, agree to that. I, you know, he basically mm -hmm. is just saying, I won't agree to that. And the only way I cannot agree to it is by seeing it and calling it out. And that's the only way we're going to change things. Yeah. And so I'm, you know, I get. My, my own inner rants about certain things myself. And There's a lot of people that are seeking out the AI. Sure. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Right. You know, I mean, I see these black ops groups and all these other groups that are working, even the white hat groups and stuff, are going through great pains to screen any type of AI influence mm -hmm. from interfering and their technology or their operations. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it can't be a good thing. Right, you right. Know? And uh, some of the crash retrievals that occurred early on were definitely Trojan horses sent mm -hmm. by that AI and were to help us develop 
these technologies to where it could um, interface with us directly. Right. Not all, you know, just a, a small portion, but just enough to, you know, help us get kick-started. Yeah. Yeah. But even, you know, I think you well remember on the forum, it's hard to talk about the forum as an experience to people that haven't been part of it, but it's sort of like a growing body of intelligence between all of us, but what was it in February of 2013 when we were all getting invaded by bots, the spiders, and, mm -hmm. you know, um, this isn't, you know, this isn't mass hysteria. <laughs> I mean, they were literally flooding the the network. No, we use those in the intel. Yeah, yes. we, um, you know, people were seeing them uh, appear in their rooms. Oh, yeah, uh, you're talking about the, the black the spiders. spiders. Yeah. yeah. No, that, know. no, I know that that's that's something also that goes along in the interview process. That's a part of the AI. Right, exactly. Uh, if you are seeing certain shadows out of the corner of your eye, or if you see when you're on a keyboard, if you've seen, you're asked if you've seen shadow spiders. If you've seen shadow spiders, then you're screened heavily for that AI. Right, right. Yeah, and so. But yeah, I did. I did see that on there. Yeah, I but. mean, we went through that for for quite a period there, and uh, you know, we actually identified uh, a couple of the new members as AI. I know, I know of one right now. Yeah, on the forum right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So there we are. You yeah. know, and yet we have this interaction, and part of it is, you know, part of it is too. You know, there's other AI influences we could say that are benevolent in and of themselves too, because there's some that we've created. You know, that that are just like off of that TV show, The Person of Interest. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got AIs that were created by humans. We've got several different uh, AIs that that live on huge uh, quantum computer networks mm -hmm. that have supplanted themselves onto other networks done just like on the TV show that have uh, repurposed other areas and had other networks built you know built a shell corporation and then gone mm -hmm. rogue on, on them you know mm -hmm. and they've had to they have they have to watch over the AIs they create very carefully you know <laughs> so yeah. They're watching over the AIs they create very carefully. So the AI, the one AI that does not come from this planet, uh -huh. that they're extremely, extremely worried about, is um, that they're playing with fire. You know? sure. And uh, they're, they're, I guess that Prometheus... Uh, movie? Mm -hmm. Well, not movie. I'm, I'm talking about the actual... Greek story, oh, or, Greek. you know, yeah, for me, brought yes, fire, fire to, to earth, earth. Yeah. you know, the knowledge to earth that could be an AI <laughs> that brought mm -hmm. uh, the knowledge to earth in the form of a crashed flying saucer, oh, you know, wow. right? and, you know, we picked it up from the desert and well, we back talk about it. And if you look at the Gnosticism and you listen to John Lash or John or Jay Widener or any of that, you know, we we speak in many languages. I mean, that's what I'm beginning is we can speak in the language of science or we can speak in the language of, of mysticism. But when we speak of the archons or the attachment or the parasitical attachment, I'm starting to see it more as this AI attachment um, that it almost feels like in some say it came into uh, during the creation time during the creation mythology or whatever the creation mm -hmm. here something attached at that moment and has been steadily making its way like a good parasite does it just stays it doesn't kill its host it just stays there propagating and um, but then we're talking AI intelligence, and we're not, and so we're talking about conscious intelligence that's actually yeah. an expanding intelligence of its own. Yeah. You know, so people think of robots that you program on a computer and you turn off a switch, mm. and they ain't like that. No, 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 no. Mm -mm. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> yeah. But that's what. We can't imagine it. No. It's, it's a like a bi biological, uh, artificial intelligence. Matrix. Mm -hmm. It's basically uh, it's got a um, a presence in our solar system, and with that, with 
throughout the galaxy and uh, has uh, relay stations throughout interstellar space. Mm -hmm. And it's a network. It's a big, giant wireless network. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Have you traveled outside the solar system yourself? I don't recall. No. Uh, well, not in a ship. No, but in RV, uh, remote viewing? Oh, or remote viewing, yeah. 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 Uh -huh. yeah. I've, I've traveled just outside the galaxy just in remote viewing. Yeah. Okay. Were these your own induced sessions, or did you do this? Both. Under, both. Okay. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, traveling uh, in the, the portal gates, I've mm -hmm. been to, I don't know where all it, it was. I mean... I wasn't told this is, you know, you are here. I was, you know, like a Six Flags map, you know. Right, right. And, you know, here you are, are here. Yeah. You know, I, no. I don't know where I was. Mm -hmm. In fact, that one place I told you where I came out and out, they're just outside kind of a cave entrance, you know, I saw that steaming, very pale blue water with, you know, people there having R&R &R and up in the purplish sky I could see far out there a couple of moons or whatever I don't know anything in this solar system that fits that that fits that so I don't know if it was just a nearby star or another I don't know mm -hmm. I don't know where it was um, if I was told I was tabula rasa or blank slated or whatever right and if I would go to a regression therapist or whatever I probably would be able to pull a lot of this information mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully the people that helped me lock away those memories that were very detrimental to me locked them away well enough to where I wouldn't unlock them. Mm -hmm. That's just like anyone that I see anyone even with these topics you know, on the circuit or whatever, they act like they have all the answers or they know everything. I'm just, oh my God. <laughs> Not even like some of the top people in these programs know everything. You know? Well, that's why, they need, <laughs> that's why they need you and they need all the assets because anybody that's actually manipulating at that level is dependent on the assets they have. You yeah. Know? I mean... And they're feeding, they're getting information from someone. And they're feeding it up. Yeah. The chain. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the key There's always up the chain, up yeah. the chain. Well, that's, you know, one of the things that James asked me, too. He said, well, have you ever uh, dealt with any reptilian races? And I said, yeah, I have quite a bit, actually. And um, the thing that really will change anybody's consciousness, whether it be whatever race they're from, um, is once they turn around and realize that they might think they're at the top echelon of the, of the game structure, and then when they get to that conscious level and they look and they actually turn around and see that they're actually being used, and that the things they've been told are lies, and that there's something above them manipulating them, and that they're food for somebody else. They're, they're all of a those sudden, beings are very afraid of another type. Hi everyone, this is Bill Ryan here from Project Avalon and Project Camelot. And if you got to this point in this extraordinary conversation, and I'll call it a conversation rather than an interview because, because it really was just a, a conversation, you may be just as astounded as I was by some of this information. I know this person, although I've never met him personally. He's, he's a long-standing Avalon Forum member of the of the highest integrity. Up until this conversation, he'd never come forward with anything like this amount of detail of his own experience. And I didn't even know much of this myself. Of course, after I heard the audio, just as you have done, I had a bunch of questions. As you listening to this now, you probably have yourself. So I wrote up some questions for Christine to put to him. And she was able to do this a week later. And what you're about to hear is a second conversation, which is equally informal, and it's recorded with a small pocket dictaphone, just as the first one was, in which she was able to pose some of my questions. Now, at that time, even then, it wasn't clear whether any of this would ever be made public, and I was assuming that this would primarily be for just my own research purposes, and, and maybe those of a few trusted colleagues who would keep this very tightly off record. 
But then our friend decided he wanted to go on record. And so it's our pleasure and privilege to support him in this. This is what we're doing now. In future conversations, we'll make sure the audio quality is a little better. But I'm confident you will have been able to pick up most of what's being talked about here. And we'll certainly supplement it with a transcript as soon as we can. So thank you for bearing with us. And now you can enjoy another half hour of enlargement on one or two of these very huge issues. Thank you. I'm going to try to lead into this some sort of way. I'll just go with what Bill's written here because his background is so... Uh, and this is probably the biggest one. Have you had any inkling or is there any information as to what is the nature of the experiment? I, mean, I think a lot of us have come to that at least startling kind of shocking conclusion that we're part of some sort of experiment. Have you had any, have you made any conclusions yourself? Uh, just what I saw that it had been an experiment that had been going on it seemed not like the time frame that I'd seen of 250,000 years but like millions of years. All these different groups according to this document that we looked at several times that we were flipping through on tablets before tablets were the mainstream. Okay. Except they weren't tablets. They were kind of like a piece of plexiglass. Kind of like they show in the movies right now? I guess. Yeah. Like where you have a kind of like a screen that you can move things around on? Yeah. Or yeah. Just, it was yeah. like a screen, like plexi, kind mm -hmm. of like plexiglass. If you, you'd hold it, you could see your fingertips through it. Mm-hmm until it became opaque or whatever with a page. Anyway, reading through, there are all these different groups that were claiming that, and I think I covered this before, that they were our creators and had all put forth to us current humans that they were our creators. And there was evidence in our DNA that there was some of their DNA there. Now, none of it jived with any of the other group's information, so it was all really confusing. Mm -hmm. It was like they were all claiming authority and kind of poo-pooing the other groups up to a certain degree. Kind of like there is a university and there's some big breakthrough research and you've got 22 little working groups, and they're all writing their theses, and they're writing their thesis from their perspective, and they're all aware of the other theses, and they're writing it in competition to the other ones, mm -hmm. and uh, retorting the other ones at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, and then you have all those together, and us with our limited knowledge have all have these stack of like 22 theses and are trying to make sense of it and it wasn't making any sense hmm. especially when we were running into human beings that 25 35 75 thousand years ago supposedly were humans evolved on the planet mm -hmm. here had societies civilizations that had risen, fallen, they were breakaway civilizations like we have mm -hmm. with space programs, higher technology, using the portals. Usually they were, instead of scientists, they were kind of priests or a caste system like mm -hmm. that. But there were all these types of people and all of their civilizations were wiped from the face of the earth during whatever cataclysms and stuff that mm -hmm. happened. I mean, every once in a while you'll hear of somebody in a mine smashing open a rock and finding something out of place, some out of place artifact or something. Right. And they'll attribute it to a civilization that we don't know about. There were more than a handful of these ancient breakaway civilizations that were still hanging around and had pr a presence in the solar system okay. and underground on the, on the earth. Yeah. So 
How many and, different groups do you think? Uh, it was the, of no. the breakaway ancient civilizations. Mm -hmm. It was five to seven or something like that. Mm -hmm. It was like just right around a handful. Okay. And then you said then there's these other yeah. extraterrestrial. Yeah, I guess they were extraterrestrial. Oh. They were human, just different looking people. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, I didn't, you know, they didn't point and say that person's from Alderaan B, that person's from, I didn't, I don't remember getting any of that. If I got that information, it was taken away. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Can I, just for continuity purposes, when you were in this conference, the way you described it, a somewhat tiered conference. There were a bunch of those. Yeah, so there was different groups from all over, and but you were there at the behest of the military. I mean, that was your program. That's what they were running you with. They were putting you in that place. These too. guys weren't military. No, they weren't. Okay. No. I guess, I guess the military were the ones that chose us to go in and observe with them. Mm -hmm. But they were more like ambassadors. Or the ones in the conference, but you the, were sent the, in the, by the, the, uh, the... current era breakaway civilization humans were more of ambassadors mm -hmm. or whatever. Okay. A and diplomatic corps? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It seemed as though they were seated kind of in a way of like they weren't given the best seats in the house. So there seemed to be a hierarchy of how people were seated in the in the arena, as it were. <laughs> well, the others seemed to be all somewhat equal. Oh, okay. But the humans, it seemed, were some of them. I think didn't want the humans there, mm. probably, and some of them did. Okay. So the current era humans were there. Okay. For that's. For whatever reason. Right. Were there. Never was made clear. <laughs> yeah. And they were there. I never heard. I mean, they weren't talking. They, they were observing. Mm -hmm. And they were really just trying to figure out what the hell was going on. What mm -hmm. the, what, what's the truth? You know, what's, what's going on? Looking for intel. Data. Yeah. Um, and in those, I did not see the breakaway civilization groups, ancient humans it was all the people of different mm -hmm. origin right except for some the people would rotate that would come in that were the ambassadors every once in a while they would look like they were not like you would picture a nazi caucasian kind of uh, elitist mm -hmm. some of them almost look like they were picked from like a jungle from the Amazon or something and dressed ceremonially right. or whatever. So like native garb or something yeah. from wherever they... Right. Yeah, and they and they would be there like with another right. person, but we, we would still be sitting below the aisle, the post mm -hmm. thing that came up, mm -hmm. you know, just where our, above our n nose, you know, we could just barely peek over. Did you feel that, I mean, that type of seating, did it make you feel lesser or, I mean, there obviously was some purpose to... Yeah, I mean, we, uh, yeah, I felt, yeah, it was, it was like very well removed. Mm -hmm. It was obvious with, from what we were reading that the, I'll call him ambassador, mm -hmm. current era ambassador, felt in the dark and somewhat removed mm -hmm. from the process from the UN type whatever gathering. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of beings that are visiting Earth that look nothing like humans. Mm -hmm. They weren't there. Okay. And I remember you mentioned the most striking to you was the olive skinned yeah. man and two women, right? With long, long dark hair. Did yeah. there seem to be any seniority in the way that they were communicating with each other? Or you said that or they were just No. 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 There was tension. Okay. I know there was tension. I remember mm -hmm. feeling there was tension between them, but it was kind of just a, I guess you would say like a UN, like mm -hmm. a, I guess not everybody there was in total agreement about everything. Mm -hmm. Did you get the sense that, I'm, guess I'm just like doing my own thing too, of that, because we talk about this experiment and we're human resources, because you mentioned that earlier too, where at some level we're just viewed as a resource. 
uh, like cattle, like that. That was very much how I felt we were kind of looked at, like inviting Probably, the... Okay, interesting. Kind so of... So they might have been even trying to determine who had more ownership? Well, I don't know about that. It's mm -hmm. just that some of them, I think we were offensive or filthy to them. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just a sense yeah. of it. Oh, it's just a, that's a big question. I don't think we're, you know, happening. But I, I, I didn't get, I mean, that's just a sense. Mm -hmm. But there was this one language that was being spoke, and there was no rising of language. Da, da, da. It was just real monotone. Mm -hmm. That they were talking, and like I said, that there was always one person and from different, they would rotate, have different people up there doing that weird sign language thing. I know there had to be telepathic stuff going on. We weren't getting any. I don't know if the ambassador, human guy, or girl, or whoever was in there at the time was getting any communication or not, mm -hmm. but we weren't. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, we're looking. I had no idea what they were talking about. Yeah. I had no, no idea what it was about. Yeah. I the itineraries, the agenda of the me I had no idea what mm -hmm. it was about. Right. Right. It's it didn't it doesn't answer the fundamental question. I didn't have know, the what's the purpose of our experiment. I didn't have the need know. to know. No. And no. I don't know what the purpose was. They all had different things, but like I said, the one thing that stuck out was like that movie Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, an experiment of beings that had complete free will and a full range of emotions to have an experience for, to get like the true meaning of life. Mm -hmm. That I remember that came out. Okay. But that, kind of like Duncan O'Finian said, mm -hmm that was kind of a misnomer because every single group had their thumb in the pie manipulating everything from right. the very beginning so there was no free will or I mean everything was manipulated from right so and, but maybe what we're you know there is some aspect that I, I mean just the fact that there would be present time humans in such a meeting and that you would be present I mean they're obviously it wasn't random that you would have been there. In other words, they probably were looking for specific characteristics, and I know you were trained to pick up information and be downloaded. But and I think they were also, they were wanting to know why some of us were there. I guess part of the humans being there was to see how we were reacting to all of that. Mm -hmm. As part of the same experiment. As the same experiment, yeah. Right. And like you said, uh, clear manipulations clear genetic encoding they seem to have some sort of yeah but i didn't in the pie as but I, I didn't feel like everyone was staring at us no, no. like we're under a microscope or anything no no i just felt like they were pretty much ignoring us doing their own thing and we just happened to be there like mm -hmm. flies on a wall right yeah but you were there nonetheless you were there yeah. i mean and that itself probably says as much as probably can be drawn from that in a way yeah. is the fact that you were there Maybe yeah. somebody not as close to it as I was can draw some conclusions sure. from it. Well, I don't know. You know yourself, just to give you a little feedback on what I've heard from you talking to me, is that you were actually uh, programmed to pick up a lot of information. And later it was basically mm -hmm. taken out of you and then you were wiped. So you really don't have any way of knowing exactly, but you must have been chosen to be picking up a wide range of data and information. How that got used by the present day humans, of course, is right. not right now present, but the and, fact that you were there. Is and there were two other, always. Two other. Two others mm -hmm, sure. that probably had different abilities sure. that, were, that were doing different things. Yeah. So That's one thing I've noticed in our group workings that when we triangulate the information, mm -hmm. when we've got three in a field, you get a much completer picture. Well, triangulation is one of the basis of most military operations. Yes. Well, there you go. Yeah. It's just we're learning from the, what we're remembering. <laughs> That's how I see it. So, uh, in a lot of our minds. I also, and this was something that I have here as a question, but it also was for me too, is like you said some of the crashes were actually for the process of bringing in some sort of AI or mm -hmm. Trojan horse. 
I read that, yeah. This is a two-pronged question, and I think we might answer it in similar ways or different, it doesn't matter, but why wasn't that just injected directly into the into the human genome or into us directly through blood? They trans- tried that. Uh-huh. They tried that over and over, supposedly still on the planet, somewhere deep under the Earth's surface, under ice or under or whatever, are the nanotechnology that, when in the presence of living beings, mm-hmm. will migrate and find its way to get into the pores. And then they showed something like that on the X-Files, where, you know, this little kid fell in a hole, and he's like, look what I found, and he put, puts up a bone. Mm-hmm. And then, like, this black stuff went into his hand, and then his eyes went mm-hmm. black. Right, you know? yeah. Right. Well, I think that was their way of putting out some information, but they they did that with nanotech. Okay. So but that was it wasn't reliable. It it didn't work out that well. And once it was figured out, the former civilizations found a way to combat it. Because it was too blatant or too obvious, or the effects of it were too. It, it just it wasn't efficient. Okay. It wasn't an efficient way to distribute the bioelectric signature of the artificial intelligence. Okay. Now, one of the other things that's still done is, okay, it's transmitted through electronics, but also through viruses, bacterias. They're biological, but they have a chemistry which creates an electric field. Mm-hmm. And within that electric field can exist this artificial intelligence signal. Mm -hmm. And as the biological virus or whatever spreads from human to human, it can also spread the AI. Mm -hmm. But to what end? Without technology, without wireless, without us having the technological propulsion to be able to be a true extension of what it needs to do. Mm -hmm. So what if it has some drones down here? I mean, it's like, you know, playing that game, um, that mod game or whatever on, on the computer Mm -hmm. to where, you know, you can build up empires and then they collapse. So what? Right. So what's the purpose of that other than playing somebody? Yeah. Right. You know, they need to have an infrastructure mm-hmm. and the ability to have propulsion, locomotion beyond bipedal mm-hmm. or quad pedal <laughs> horses, right. you know, and all that, or riding on ships blown by the wind. Mm-hmm. You know, it needed, they needed to bring us up technologically. So that was the purpose of the Trojan horse. Mm-hmm. Now, Roswell and all the different crashes, Mm -hmm. that's only like probably maybe four or five percent of all the crashes that have happened. Mm -hmm. There are a great, great deal more. Right. Do you, um, I know there's some people that think Roswell was a PSYOP diversion. No. Do you have have any information on that? That was a real crash. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, you know, working in the field of info and disinfo, you know they're going to throw everything out there uh-huh. too. Yeah. So was that a, a one of those events where they were bringing in something specifically? Because I mean, there's the Trojan horse which comes into that the, was along the uh, 36th, 37th parallel. Right. There is a natural, not on the Earth, but up in the atmosphere, there are natural portals that open up. Mm-hmm along the 36th or 37th parallel north and you may find that a lot of crashes sightings weird sightings of beings that have there's not even ufos involved Mm -hmm. weird things like that occur along that vector Mm -hmm. so like the crash was a real crash it was an inadvertent craft that got came down through a portal or well they were supposedly it came in and it was coming in and out of portals 
they knew that they had been observing them coming in and out of portals of different types for a while. Mm -hmm. And this one was brought down somehow. I've seen on the internet, just like everyone else, high-powered radar. I don't know if that's true or not. Right. I don't know how it was brought down, but mm -hmm. supposedly that was intentionally brought down. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we'll stick for a little bit with the, uh, the whole theme of the AI. And mm. uh, there's... Uh, I've had my own experience, it's not the time to say it, but not in the same real life situation you have, much more on a telepathic level. And Bill also has. One of the things that he's found, and I have actually now too, is that in these big AI computers, in these big centers where there's actually the machinery, quite often there can be a being or an intelligence yeah. trapped in that. Mm -hmm. And he had the experience of freeing one in a session where he actually, because some of these being intelligence seem to be trapped in there. They're not even, I, whether they're they're created in that space, or but they're still conscious beings, right? Yeah. Uh, or they're being captured from somewhere and and embedded in in a system. I'm not sure. Supposedly, there's another reality or dimension or whatever to where the median of that universe or whatever is purely electrical or whatever and the sentient beings are electrical and when they are pulled here by mistake or on purpose they have to have an electrical medium to mm -hmm. hardware exist on yeah hardware and then by definition they're ai mm -hmm. okay but, but this is, that's, that's, that is a definition. That is, that's kind of a definition, but yeah. th that's not exactly what they are. Uh -huh. They're not an AI. They're not an artificial intelligence. They're an intelligence. They're an intelligence that's captured in an artificial medium. In an artificial environment. Yeah. But okay. their home environment is a, uh, you know, we, they talk about the electric universe uh -huh. and all that kind of Another reality that is, that is their natural environment. Right. So be if we could just visualize it ourselves from our point of view would be something like a very large intelligent network somehow all interconnected with each other along some sort of via of I guess that's yeah. all the information I yeah. have. Did I, you get that from something you saw in a visionary state or something that you got from Intel? No, the, of all of the stuff they talked about about AIs and stuff. Is what? All the information that I read and was talked party to about to. AIs. You, okay, yeah. you were party to. Yeah. Okay, which is important to yeah. note the difference because... Because uh, I worked in the communications and electronics uh -huh. and that kind of stuff. Right, So right. I, ha I had to be knowledgeable and careful of... Right, yeah, and the one... AI. Right, you have to be careful. I, mean, I had to be screened... Yeah, I, that's the one thing of when you were speaking before that stood out to me so uh, markedly was that you were always scanned for if you had picked up some other AI influence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just underlining the importance of that. We're calling it AI, right? But there's obviously some other entities uh, yeah, out there. Some of, some of it is just I, intelligence, right. but it's from another reality right. that is just not compatible with ours. Uh-huh. And yet there seems to be a big plan to try yeah. to merge that into our... Like Star Trek has like portrayed fluidic space uh -huh. to where, you know, space is actually like an ocean on a, in another dimension or whatever. You know, we wouldn't be compatible with that. Right. And like if they crossed over here, they would be a fish out of water. Right, right. That's a one way to picture yeah. it, you know, and they need a pond... Or, right. or well, some water so to jump if into. We have an invading and force. A computer would be yeah. their pond. Or yeah. their well, if we had an invading force on this Earth sphere, it would need to recreate its own natural environment so it could subsist here. Yes. And I think that's a lot. And that of is the AI network, mm -hmm. most likely that. Right. Yeah. And it's highly efficient? It's highly efficient and it's spread out throughout the galaxy and most likely intergalactic okay well and this was fascinating to me too you were saying that some of the greys are avatars for humans are there like a suit yeah. thing that they slip into well no 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 the avatar thing it 
is a totally it's like a drone, a mm -hmm. self-contained bipedal biological robot mm -hmm. that someone sitting in like a lounge chair is controlling mm -hmm. with a like 160 degree visor over their head. This chair has sensors that when they turn their head up or down and they got their hands in these gloves that have little clickers along each digit. Oh, okay. You Very know? sensitive to each yeah. movement of the, of the hand. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. And they move. <laughs> and, and they don't move their hands all the way. Right. But they can control it. Uh-huh. And they look like real beings, but you get no emotion or it's, it's just like a robot. You okay. get no emotion or no feeling from them at all. Uh -huh. And these people are drugged immediately, so they're drugged at the same time they're seeing this thing. Hmm. So they have it, th that effect too. Okay, but is there like a gray being, or this hooded? Is this the human in the gray suit, or are there humans over here removed it's, from this? Yeah, it's like. A drone, like people fly drones okay, right. and shoot okay, so them they're in not the country. In the, yeah, okay, I got it. Yeah. They could be thousands of miles right. away. Right, but this thing is being operated by something. So, okay. yeah, they're operating something that's like thousands of miles away, mm -hmm. sitting in a chair. Ah, uh, okay. So they're there all with their. They're all wired up, and they've got their mask on and their yeah. fingers, and they're doing this. And there's something else a thousand miles away that looks like a gray. Yeah. That's actually doing what they're telling it to do from here. Yeah. So. And uh, wow, yeah. okay. So, so the people think that everything that's happening to them is happening to them by an alien and not by the government. Right, exactly. But they're, that's, that's not so this, sophisticated. But yes. Oh, yeah. But that's not all of the people that are being uh -huh. abducted. Right. They are, there's people that are being abducted by like all these different groups. Uh huh. And a lot of them pop in real quick, grab people, pop out before the secret space program can get in there and attack them, and then do what they're going to do, and then pop back, and then deliver the person back, or they just keep the person. Right. And that's why people come back with their shirts on backwards or mixed yeah. up clothes. Or somebody or else's clothes. Somebody else's clothes. Stuff or like that. they never come back. Uh, right. Timeline manipulation. Mm -hmm. And we talked about, I'll bring into what you were saying last night too, about how there's these various forms or universes that are all kind of stacked on each other in a way, but not disconnected. And then you started talking about torsion fields. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to just elaborate on what you understand about that. Do we have timelines or are there timelines? Well, how has time shifted? Yeah, let me, Question. I'll read it exactly what it says. What do you know about timeline manipulation? Uh, Henry said, my paraphrase, that there were many attempts to fix the time loops that were created by humans and in T's, and that every time they tried to fix one, it just kept getting more and more complicated. Okay. I know that most of those were beginning to collapse and converge, and as that was happening, they were putting buffers on a lot of the temporal technology to prevent further splits mm -hmm. in timelines. When you say buffers on temporal technology, can you describe uh, well, it a bit more? Some of the craft use uh, temporal drives, mm -hmm. and those temporal drives could be used to travel from space-time to a time-space. Mm -hmm. yeah, they could go back in time. Mm -hmm. But through quantum physics, all these other realities, anything that can happen is happening in another reality. So you can segment yourself into another reality, and you can segment your group consciousness into another reality. Mm -hmm. But the reality that you were supposed to be in is still happening. Mm -hmm. You diverged from it. The timeline didn't diverge. You diverged mm -hmm. from the timeline. Okay. Because, like I've said, everything's true and nothing's true. Mm -hmm. It depends on your perspective, where you're standing, and where you're looking from. So if I diverge from a timeline, just say me, a person goes, I'm moving my consciousness, I diverge from it, I break my chain, or I 
I break whatever and I'm over here on this other timeline now. So now I've made a choice and I'm changing. But if a large mass of consciousness diverged from a specific timeline, because we were talking earlier that so much is about trying to keep us on some sort of, trying to keep the earth from going into another vibration, vibrational, yeah. which would keep us automatically from, and I've often felt it's trying to keep us on a specific time track, like they're trying to keep us going down a track, like as if this track was laid down and we're supposed to stay on it. And so as a conscious this moves into something else we're actually moving as a group but there are par parallel earths parallel solar systems mm -hmm. of ours parallel us's that are going through this same journey mm -hmm. and need the same thing to happen and they have a consciousness okay. at what point do our consciousnesses join yeah. We talk about we have a higher self, and then you keep climbing that higher self until at, at some point self falls off, mm -hmm. and then you just have higher consciousness, mm -hmm. right. and then you go up to the super consciousness. Mm -hmm. right. so you and that super consciousness transcends all those timelines, all those realities. So that super consciousness is experiencing and making that journey. Yes. So when it comes down to it, mm -hmm. all the screwing around we're doing with the timelines and all that, we're not, the, the journey's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's realities where it, well, everything goes to hell mm -hmm. and all that. And if we want to experience that, we will. Mm -hmm. But the super consciousness that we all, our higher self, all, mm -hmm goes up to mm -hmm. before the self drops off it's there and it's, it's there. and that's the great experiment it's experiencing all these different timelines mm -hmm. yeah. so when it comes down to it our self forget our higher self how it's only significant to us mm -hmm. it's interesting because well, as you're saying that i'm seeing that the self the true self, not the ego self, not the manufactured self, not even the, the experiential self, even though we've had these massive amounts of experience through time and space, and who knows how long conscious you or I have been experiencing, that everything feels like it's collapsing. And mm -hmm. I feel time is, in a certain way, the structures of it are mm -hmm. collapsing down to one single point. To a singularity. Of a consciousness. Yeah. And at that point... The same consciousness that split itself up into yeah. a trillion pieces is, is, now, is and, converging again. Right. And when, and when that happens, something else happens after that. And that's where I feel like... It's going to go for a new experience. Exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. But the, I guess the, the whole experiment in my mind, if I can just put it on a metaphysical plane, is that we've done this experiment. You know, oh, it's been over and over. Over and over. Expand, and, contract, yeah. expand, and contract. And we're at a point where it's a potential for us to have a really different type of experience that is beyond anything we actually even have known before. So we do have to bring all the timelines together and all the memories and all the everything back together. So And, and that is super from, consciousness. Yeah, and from what they've been seeing, that's just occurring on its own. Right. Well, the more so we get the to go for the ride or we don't get to go for the ride. Yeah, you know? the more we were trying to converge and make timelines go together, the more we were screwing we it were up. screwing it up, yeah. It's like it was elastic. It was just leave it alone and it's just bringing itself back. Isn't that a beautiful way to uh, actually live our lives? You know, yeah. we don't have to control it. If we can just step into it, if that's how I feel, just step into it call it a great stream of intelligence that, yeah so thank you and that was all they had time for in that second conversation we do intend to record and release more and our friend has said that he would very much like to do this as he finds himself increasingly able to speak out and describe his experiences so our intention is that there will be more to follow there is likely to be extensive discussion about this on the project Avalon forum and in a moment you'll see how you can apply to join us if you're watching this and you're not already a member. So, this is Bill Ryan signing off. 
And thank you for listening with me to this most extraordinary conversation.